Last week, South Korea and the United States agreed to lift restrictions on Seoul's use of solid fuel or rocket fuel. This breakthrough comes four decades after the restrictions were imposed in 1979 to stop an arms race in the region, and it now finally gives South Korea the green light to vastly improve its missile capacity, as well as unlock commercial possibilities in space technology. Today, we explore the potential of rocket fuel for South Korea and whether it could provide a new engine for economic growth. For this, we have joining us today Dr. J.R. Reagan, CEO of Idea Explorer Global, joining us from Tedon. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. All right, thank you for joining us. We also connect with Dr. Graham Ong Webb, who joins us from Singapore's Nanyang University. It's lovely to see you again. How are you? Good, thank you. Good to be here. Right, great to see you both. Well, Dr. Reagan, let's start with you first. So what exactly is solid fuel or rocket fuel and what advantages does it have to other fuel sources? The solid fuel rockets uh, are actually easier to handle and easier to store uh, compared to their liquid fuel counterparts that making them more ideal for rocket engines. And because they're easier to handle and store, they're easier to make uh, rockets, which now allows Korea to start exploring more simplistic designs and making things cheaper to construct. And that allows for, uh, as you mentioned before, commercial possibilities that weren't there before. And well, now let's go back to why the, the US was restricting South Korea's use of rocket fuel over the past decades. So Dr. Ong Webb, why was, what was the reason for this restriction and uh, why are they lifting it now? Well, um... The restrictions actually relate to the, the, the properties of, of solid fuel that uh, Dr. Reagan just uh, shared with us. Uh, one of which, of course, is the, 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 st the long storage or shelf lives of these uh, of solid fuels, uh, and also the ability to, um, to trigger off combustion and to launch a, a rocket uh, quickly because, because uh, the, these propellants are already mounted and, 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 and you know, uh, mated with, the, with the, the, the missile itself. So the implications are quite significant. Uh, they allow um, a, a country that has um, a solid fuel capability for their rockets to have a quick uh, readiness time, a, a quicker response time, and therefore uh, uh, bolsters the military capabilities of, of that country. And so the restrictions, I think, were put in place to sort of stymie and just hold back any uh, propensity or inclination by the South Korean government uh, of the day to actually, um, uh, you know, invest uh, more in this capability uh, against uh, the North uh, Korean missile threat. But I think the landscape possibly has shifted uh, towards a different place today that might uh, have uh, prompted the Americans to give uh, the South Korean government today a bit more flexibility. Uh, so that's, that's my opinion. But I, of course, we can't foreclose uh, this, this, this uh, uh, other path, the commercial path, where it gives uh, uh, South Korea a more flexibility all around in terms of its science and technology initiatives. And so uh, solid fuels can clearly be used for, for commercial purposes as well uh, with regards to space flight. And Dr. Ong Webb, how has the restriction limited South Korea from boosting its missile capacity, especially in terms of deterring North Korea? And how do the two Korea's missile technologies actually compare? Well, uh, from, from my view or, or, or survey of things at least, uh, um, it's not as if South Korea hasn't had a solid fuel capability to begin with. It has had that for some time, but even that capability has been under a, a restriction in terms of the, uh, the, the specific impulse that's allowed uh, for South Korea, I think it was about 1 million pounds per second. What we're talking about is a solid fuel capability that's of a lower thrust and therefore one that carries a smaller uh, that goes a shorter distance and carries a smaller smaller payload. Uh, now, I think that that cap, of course, is restricted. So I think uh, we can well, look okay, at more powerful uh, solid fuels, uh, in a sense. Uh, and I think uh, that was going to, to change the game a little bit in terms of uh, possibly allowing South Korea to deliver uh, missiles with higher uh, um, uh, payloads of, uh, of munitions uh, in, in light of a security context, right? Um, uh, but uh, when it comes to the issue of the, the missile gap between North and South Korea, I think one can argue that I think for some time today, uh, uh, South Korea has had a very competent 
uh, 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 conventional missile capability. I mean, uh, third-party assessments, of course, have have, have reported that uh, you know the South Korean military is technically able to reach almost any target uh, uh, in North Korea uh, in, 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 in terms of trying to meet its uh, national security goals. So that's been in place. But I think now with this um, removal of the restriction, uh, it might allow the South Korean military to, to explore options for more lethal, uh, lethal conventional missiles uh, to, to bolster national security. But I, I say this with some hesitance because uh, we need to see what the effects of this are going to be in terms of uh, stability on both sides. I mean, recently the North Korean regime has, has, uh, has actually uh, stated its abstentions about, uh, about uh, this uh, recent development. Well, Dr. Reagan, now all South Korean companies, research institutes and nationals will be free to research, develop, produce and even own not only liquid fuel but also solid fuel, as we mentioned, and various types of hybrid space rockets without any restrictions. So what kind of commercial opportunities do you see in opening up these restrictions? Yeah, I think it goes hand in hand with the recent announcements of the Digital New Deal, which is all about creating more opportunities for the economy through high tech, uh, what they call uh, DNA, data networks and AI. And I think that's what we see, uh, you know, ground based. But when we start to leverage those uh, through space technology, it goes broader. And now you can export that technology and create wider networks to even more countries. So I think that's where the opportunity lies. And when you combine that with some of the technology that Korea has with 5G, mm -hmm. with things like KPS, which is the uh, uh, Korean positioning system, starts to allow for commercial opportunities in geospatial, urban planning, agriculture, port management, a whole range of things for a commercial that weren't there before. And Dr. Ong Reb, do you think this could also be a great um, commercial opportunity for South Korea, perhaps even to develop its own version of SpaceX? Well, definitely. I think, uh, I think uh, uh, anything is possible. I mean, in the least, the removal of this restric restriction gives more space, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, more, more freedom for the research community, uh, both across the public and private sector, in uh, South Korea to to you know to uh, venture into new into new areas um, so i think i think this is a is a is a worthy thing but uh, i mean uh, spacex definitely is possible i think south korea wants to get into into the same game as uh, elon musk's uh, spacex is right now i mean a lot of uh, new entrants into the space sector uh, we earlier talked about the uae coming into the picture I mean, Japan and China have been front runners for a long time, uh, you know, uh, alongside the Americans as well. Uh, so I think this is going to be a very interesting chapter uh, in, in terms of uh, space related research and development. But of course, the, the space sector is notoriously difficult to do well in. Um, but, uh, you know, South Korea has the technical uh, and engineering wherewithal as a powerhouse, uh, you know, uh, on the global stage to, to get into this into this sector as well. So I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, uh, journey uh, going forward. Well, building on the possibility of commercial opportunities for Korea, Dr. Reagan, how important is the space industry right now in the world? Do you think more and more countries are going to start venturing into outer space technology as a way of uh, growing their economies? Yeah, I think we're going to see that. We've seen that with uh, the UAE example in the last five years. It's grown its investments uh, over five, almost six billion dollars. We've also seen that China has stated its uh, value from its space technology services was over 49 uh, billion U.S. dollars in 2019 and is expected to grow to almost 60 billion in, in uh, 2020. Japan, the same way, uh, has designs to uh, profit from about 400 billion today to almost 1 trillion by 2040. So if you look at those numbers, that really says that the economy can grow from terrestrial or ground-based uh, economies to space through space technologies. Well, in the past, the uh, space race was confined to um, two former worlds, well, the world superpowers back then, the United States and the USSR. But 
Dr. Onwab, um, nowadays, do you see a commercial space race uh, possibly happening? And how, um, to you as well, just how important is the space industry these days? Well, uh, well, first of all, space is definitely in the future. I mean, there's so much untapped pot uh, potential uh, uh, in the space uh, realm, and not just in terms of uh, communications and unlocking more communications on a, on, a, on a global plane, but also in terms of space exploration. I mean, we've, we've uh, not made it past, I mean, in terms of human space travel, uh, we've not ventured beyond the moon. So, of course, Mars is, 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 is of course, a, a very important goal. And who knows beyond? I mean, so uh, the need to unlock all of this is important, particularly when we see a convergence of whole host of technologies in the 21st century uh, in terms of unprecedented computing power and communications technologies uh, and uh, robotics uh, and uh, even in terms of aerospace engineering. So I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, time uh, for, for, for uh, you know, in terms of uh, getting into this, this, uh, this particular uh, domain. Um, I feel that um, the commercial sector is the best uh, uh, segment of society to lead this uh, because uh, we're looking at uh, a lot of disruption occurring in the commercial space uh, for various reasons. Um, and I think we should let the commercial sector lead the way. And the likes of SpaceX or even Blue Origin uh, are, are, are exemplars of this. And I think we'll see more of that going forward. I mean, right now, in terms of the R&D dollars, we're finding the bulk of the R&D dollars actually uh, coming out from the commercial sector as compared to the public sector, I think almost by a factor of 17, according to some uh, reports, including one by the United, the United Nations. So I think the commercial space is really uh, the, the, uh, the, the key reference point today. And I, I don't think we should stop that. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more uh, this unlocking of new breakthroughs that will come out from uh, the, the whole suite of startups that are now entering the space sector. And we're seeing countries like U the UAE trying to build um, entrepreneurship uh, in the space industry as well. And Dr. Reagan, do you think this could possibly be an example for South Korea in terms of building a competitive space industry? Yeah, you know, when you look at uh, countries like UAE, it was a designed investment. It was a strategic choice to take uh, a, a, an area that wasn't really dominated in, at all in that region and invest in space technologies. And they're doing very, very well. And I think we're starting to see the same kind of strategic outlook from Korea, that it has on one hand uh, outstanding technologies uh, in 5G and technology and high tech and, and networks, but having the ability to, to deploy those uh, in, a, in a larger way to more countries then opens up new markets it didn't have. So I think it's a, it's a great model that they're looking f forward to replicating in some way, but using the technology back end that it already has. And Dr. Ong Webb, how important is it geopolitically as well to procure um, competent space technologies? Uh, it's very important. I mean, I mean, as we know from the 60s, the space race of the, the 1960s and, and after between, uh, you know, the United States of America and the then Soviet Union, uh, and of course, uh, ensuingly China came into the picture. I mean, uh, to, to be able to play in the space sector, to send rockets into you know, low Earth orbit to begin with and to put payloads up in space, satellites, etc. It's really, uh, and beyond, it's really a, 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 a signal that a country has arrived technologically. Um, so space really is literally the leading edge of where technologies uh, can go uh, and reflective of, the, of the, 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 the overall science and technological competency of a nation. So I think it's very important uh, uh, symbolically. But beyond that, there are a lot of spin-off effects that, um, that, that come out from space-related research and development. We're talking about new materials uh, that uh, are spin-off and uh, to which uh, society can benefit from. Uh, new kinds of chemicals and new kinds of computing technologies all spun out from space R&D. So I think the, the knock-on positive benefits are immense. Uh, because of, of the, the leading edge nature of space related research. So I think uh, it, it, it unlocks a lot of new potential to which uh, can benefit society across various other domains. 
And these new uh, possibilities, the potential of new discoveries and uh, technological advancements, they're really limitless. So very exciting times that we're in, especially for South Korea. I'm afraid this is where we'll have to wrap up the discussion. That was Dr. J.R. Agan, CEO of Idea Explorer Global, and Dr. Graham on Webb of Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Thank you both for joining the program. Thank you. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you for watching. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with more global insights on issues making headlines. Have a good one wherever you are. Goodbye.